afternoon to all. Uh, am I speaking loud enough? Can you hear me? Uh, this is the first time that I've given this presentation. Uh, when I was uh, asked to do it, I thought I'd speak about the commitment of traders report, which I'm going to very briefly, because I have other data which I've accumulated in the last 10 days or so, which is far more important than that. Um, and I see you've got, uh, the, the, this. I was going to talk about the COT, but now I'm talking about the London bullion market. The fix is in. Every day on the London exchange, there's an AM fix at 10.30 local time and a PM fix at 3 PM. And then what happens inside those times, times and outside those times has, uh, it was something that Gatta cottoned on to years ago through the work of uh, uh, board member, Gatta, Gatta board member Adrian Douglas and German uh, gold researcher Dimitri Speck. But on Friday last week, a report came out of New Zealand by uh, two guys from SK Options Trading in Wellington, New Zealand, uh, which laid it out cold. I've never seen it presented in such a way, and it, the manipulation of the gold market is there for all to see. And I'm still personally, emotionally, and psychologically trying to get my head around what's on these charts because it's absolutely amazing. But before we get into that, I just want to briefly touch on the commitment of traders so you know what I'm talking about in my report. And I'm just going to give you the Reader's Digest version and the very brief Reader's Digest version of the report. This is what this, there's about 27 commodities or 23 commodities traded on the CFTC on the, Com on the COMEX in New York. This is the silver chart. We get it every or every Friday at 3.30 uh, Eastern time. And when I talk, uh, there's three, it's divided into three sections. Uh, there's the non-commercial, the commercial, and the non-reportable positions. Uh, the non-commercials are the traders that follow the black boxes, technical indicators, moving averages, they sell, they sell when it crosses this and they sell when, buy when it crosses that. Uh, Ted Butler calls them the brain, Ted, brain dead technical funds because they don't trade on, on fundamentals, they just trade on, on the, the black boxes. The commercial traders, that's where the uh, large bullion banks are, the large commercial traders. Originally the CFTC was set up to mitigate risk between producers, the guys who dug it out of the ground, and the people that actually use it, the industrial users like Kodak, who just announced the other day that they were going into receivership. So that's what the CFTC uh, and the COMEX was invented for, was so people could lay off risk between producers, uh, consumers, and uh, the people who were prepared to bet either for or against it. But now it's turned into a real three-ring circus and is basically a Ponzi scheme. Uh, what I want to point out here is these two numbers here. Oh, I'll first go over open interest. It's 107,000 contracts. A contracted silver is 5,000 ounces. So when you see an open interest of 107,000, it means there's 107,000 longs, uh, futures contracts, and 107,000 shorts. So there can never be more longs than there are shorts. There has to be, you can't go in there and price a long unless somebody's prepared to go short against you, and you can't go short unless somebody's prepared to go long against you. And what you have here is this is the commercial position. This is where JP Morgan, HSBC, the other bullion banks in the world are, and they basically run the show from this position. Uh, the number of trade, and the other thing is interesting there's about 100 and 154 traders that are licensed to trade COMEX futures, and they can be anywhere in the United States, Canada, England, France, Germany, any place they want to. They can be bullion banks. Small commercial traders like MF Global was a big trader. That would they would be one that would trade in the commercial category. So it's companies like that that trade hundreds and thousands of contracts per day. These are the big boys, and these are the technical traders that trade the black boxes. And these little the guys over here are the non-reportables. That's people like you and me that are trading one, two, three, five, ten, whether wheat, oat, barley, rye, sugar, corn, natural gas, oil, whatever. This is where our trades would show up. In. So we're basically the small fry, but it's these guys here that really control it. The commercial net short position, uh, between that's the, dis the difference between the, who's short and who's long. It's about 16,000 contracts, which is about 80 million ounces of silver. Now, if you take that uh, commercial short position, there's, there's eight big traders in the commercial category of silver. This is just the silver market itself. The one through four traders uh, control 52% of the short position. And of that amount, JP Morgan is half of that. So one trader controls 
about 18,000 Comex silver contracts on the short side. And the five through eight traders control 13% of the market. So between uh, these two here, the eight, the one through eight traders, they control 13 and 52, that, is that 52? Yeah, 65%, thank you very much. I need all the help I can get and I appreciate it. So we got 65% uh, of the market controlled by eight traders on the short side. And 50% of this position is JP Morgan and about 20% of that is HSBC USA. And the rest of them are small traders and they would be uh, Citigroup maybe, Goldman Sachs. There's, there's a lot of traders. Mitsui out of Japan is a big trader on the, on the, on the COMEX. Anyway, there's these, there's these 41 traders that are short and eight of them are short 65% of the market. And the long side, there's 35 traders split up that way. So you can see that these eight traders basically control the market. Now that's just one commodity, silver. If you take those eight traders and those four traders and stick them on a graph, I've run this in my column hundreds of times over the last few number of years. This is rice. And this is the days to cover the short prediction. In other words, if the world produced, uh, all the world production that's produced, it would take this many days for these people who are short to cover the short position of the world production. You can see that rice, crude oil, wheat, cotton, they're all down here around five or 10 days of world silver or world production. But once you get past cocoa, which is an exceptional case because right now they're in the major bull market, there's a big shortage of cocoa. Okay, but if you look at the right here, these are the precious metals. There's palladium, platinum, gold, and that's silver. It would take 95 days of world silver production to produce nothing else but to cover for them to cover that position. And there are the four traders right there, that red line. And the five through eight are this little beast right here. So you've got half of that position right there. That's JP Morgan all by themselves. And HSBC owns about that much. So you can see it's very, very concentrated in, in, the, in uh, just a few traders. And this is what drives the price of silver. And if you're wondering why the precious metals are doing what they're doing, it's because these four traders run the show. They have no effect on the price of rice or crude oil or anything down here because they have their days of production to cover are only like five or 10 days, which is normal in an average market. There was a time a year and a half ago when this was 180 days. The big banks were short six months world silver production. They neither produce the, the item nor consume it. So what are they doing in there? They're only in there for one reason and that's to influence the price because they don't want it to go up. Now if you look at the over-the-counter market, this is the, this is the OCC's, the Office of the Controller of the Currency. Every quarter they produce a report that shows the U.S. bullion banks and how short they are and how long they are in the commodity market. And you can see from here, uh, there's about 6,000 U.S. banks, and three of them hold 99.9999% of all the uh, derivatives in commodities, interest rates, whatever it is. It's all controlled by J.P. Morgan, and you can see they owe 135 billion out of this pie. HSP has 39 billion, and that really tiny sliver is divided up between Citibank and the Bank of America. No other banks of the 6,000 are involved in the derivatives market uh, in the gold and silver price suppression scheme or any other commodity. That's, this is just gold and silver. Okay? There's, they just aren't there. So you can see this is just another way of showing that these two banks, especially, basically run the show in the precious metals market. I don't care whether it's platinum or palladium or silver or gold. They're in them up to their necks. This is the graph that was uh, done from data by a German researcher, Dimitri Speck. And I got Nick Laird at sharelinks.com in, uh, in Australia to draw this up for me a couple of years back. And what it does is it says, it says the average gold price has been obtained from four years worth of data from March 2008 to March, or 2006 to March 2010, which is approximately 1,000 trading days. Now, when you, when you put up a 1,000 trading days, you get a pretty good average. That's a big, long timeline for, 
for any commodity. So you, you, you cancel out the day to day and you get down to seeing how the price moves per day on average over four years. And I'll just start here. This is where it opens in the Far East. Okay, and you can see the trend line in the Far East through Europe, through Japan, Tokyo, Australia, uh, Southeast Asia, and then through Europe. And then this is the London Open, not right here, that's a peak. That's about 10 minutes before the London Open, but that's the peak for the gold price or silver price. But this is the gold price. And from there, it's all downhill until we get what is called the London AM fix, which is this red line here. And you can see that there's a drop there. And that is there, not every day, but if you average it over four years, it shows up. You can't hide this sort of thing when you have this kind of data. So from the PM fix, which is about 3.30 in the morning, no, 5.30 in the morning US time, uh, it sort of goes, increases, and then we have the COMEX, the commodity exchange opens at 8.20 a.m. Eastern time. And the first thing you see is the price goes down. And it takes it back to where the London AM fix flows was. It flows the London AM fix. So all the gains that occurred between here and here are gone plus a bit more. From there it rallies. And this little peak here, that little peak right there is not the London PM fix. That's the opening of the, uh, of the uh, equity markets in New York, 9.30 a.m. Okay, so they, they hit the gold price in over four years. You can see they hit it right at 9.30. And this big drop here is the London PM gold fix at 3 p.m. local time. And they take it down, and of course it rises back. And the low actually is at 12.30, or I'm sorry, 11.30 a.m. Eastern time in New York, if you'd use four years worth of data. And from there it sort of rises into the close of the, of the COMEX trading, which is 1.30 in the afternoon local time. But the two things you should draw from here is the fact that from the low here to the high here, which is the London Open, this is the PM fix. This is the low just after it. From here up to here, the price rises. And from here down to here, the price falls. Okay? It's always up in the X London market. And it's always down in the London AM to PM fix market. Not every day. But on average, over four years, this is what it's shown. And this is the graph that Dimitri came up with. And we had got it been using for years. And I always thought I was very impressed by that. But uh, two weeks ago, like I said, or last weekend, uh, the assistant Sam and Bob Kirtley out of New Zealand uh, came up with this, a new set of graphs. And I'd never seen them before. They were amazing. And what they did is they, they took this four years and they expanded it out over 20 years not just averaging it, they showed the market as it went. And what they said is if you bought the AM fix here, if you could magically buy the AM fix and sell the PM fix, you would lose money. But if you bought it at the PM fix and sold at the AM fix, you would make money. Well, that chart obviously shows that to anybody. But what this chart shows, and Nick Laird from Australia did these for me. He took the charts from this, these two New Zealand chaps, and he expanded it back to 1970. So this chart represents 1970 to 2011 is 40 some years. So we're looking at the gold price from 40 from 42 years ago, and what he said is basically, if you bought an ounce, $35 worth of gold, okay, not an ounce of gold, but spent $35 and invested it in. Uh, and bought at the London AM fix and sold at the London PM fix on on uh, January 1st, 1970, and then sold it on December 31st of this last year. Your $35 investment would be, and there's two charts I'm going to show. I'm just sort of. This is the London AM fix. We know it. We all know this chart. This is the same open, $35. Okay. There's the gold price. It rose to 100 right there in 1975. And there's the bull market we had in 1980, 81. And you can see the price barely moved. Okay? This is your $35 you're buying at the AM fix and selling at the PM fix in London. And slowly over time, buying the AM fix, selling the PM fix, your $35 investment would be $4.36. Now, now. That's if you traded the AM 
to PM Fix in London. Now, if we go excellent at the bottom of PM Fix in London, held it all through the night through Euro Asia, Europe, the whole nine yards, the red line on the next graph is still the same. It's still, a, it's still the London AM Fix gold price, which we all know and love. But, the P, but if you sold it at the PM Fix and bought it the next morning rather than holding it the way they're holding it here, this is what the price of gold, this is what you get for your $35. If you if you held it the other way for 42 years, that's thirteen thousand five hundred dollars. If you bought at the PM fix and sold the London fix, I don't know if you can play that game or not. If there's a way of arbitraging it, it's beyond my capabilities, and I'm not here to try to say you can do it or you can't do it. I'm just saying if you bought the AM fix and sold the PM fix in London, you, your thirty-five dollars went down to four dollars over 42 years. And if you bought the PM fix and sold it the next morning at the AM fix, your $35 would be $13,500. Okay. It's, it's an amazing chart. And I looked at it, I still, and this is, this is, this fix, this red line here is this red line here. But the difference is whether you invest in, at the AM and sell the PM or buy the PM and sell the AM. This next chart is a logarithmic chart. It is exactly the same stuff, except Nick has put it all on one graph. This is four bucks down here. This is your AM fix here, which is what is it today? Around sixteen hundred and something. And there's the price you would have got if you'd bought the PM and sold the AM. So you can see that the big thing in this graph, if you notice, is that from about there's a discontinuity here. Everything was fine up until about here. Okay, everything sort of followed, but after 1979, things changed. And you can see that this, see there's a discontinuity here. You can see it right up and down the graph. That's the bottom of the, of the gold price back in 19, the third quarter of 1999. And you can see immediately that these two lines, which were close together at one point, start to get further apart. So you can see the suppression is becoming more aggressive, and the next chart shows that clearly. Just want to make my point here. Okay, this is 1999. To 2011. If you bought London, every two bars, this is one year, two years, year, two bars, one for the London AM to PM fix, the other one from X London. If you bought the London fix and sold the London PM fix, this is what you would have lost. If you bought the London PM fix and waited until next morning to sell the London AM fix, this is what you would have gained. We've been in a raging bull market in gold for 13 years, and all of those 13 years, London has been negative. Nick Laird says the chances, of, uh, the probabilities that are billions to one. So this is obviously a price fixing um, scheme that's been going on for a while. The percentage get higher and higher. This suppression becomes larger and larger. I can't, I can't read this, but. Uh, this is in percent. I, I'm, I'm sorry, it's not big enough to read, but it's about 25, 30 percent in here, 15 to 20 percent. So the average has been about 15 to 20 percent every year. But what what X London has or has given us, London has taken away. And like I said, if we could average it out over 40 years, price of gold right now would be stratospheric. Can you imagine what it'd be like if London was trading without manipulation? So what we'd see here is these red charts would be green just like everybody else's. Everybody would want to bid the price up. And I don't even want to know what the gold price would be. It would be an astronomical number. Now this is in percent, and I'm sorry I can't read it. I, thank you. This is, the, uh, this is in dollars from 1999, start of the bull market. And you can see the London, of course, is always down. And it's about 3,400 up and about 1,300 down, or I, roughly. So if we could take these bars, in other words, if you could remove London from the equation right now, gold would be about $13,000 an ounce. Or 30, 30, that's, on these eight years here, it would be $2,300 an ounce right now, just on these eight years. But if you go back to 1970, the, the compounding that went on since then, because it started off on a much lower base and had a lot more years to compound. So you can see just in our bull market right here that every place except London and New York, the price rises, and everywhere in London and New York, 
It's, or in London and New York, it always falls. Always. There's no exception to that. There's this chart in here. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm missing. I thought it was here, and it's not. Um, I had it going back to 1970, okay, and I, for whatever reason, ever, I've omitted to include it in the presentation that I emailed to, uh, to Casey Research. What I did is it showed this chart, not just for these 13 years here from 2011, all the way back to 1999, but I went back to 1970. And what it showed is that the London US pressure on the market between 10, the London AMTEX and the TMTEX has been ongoing and continuous. And the last time that the London market was positive for the price of gold was 1979. So that's 21 plus 11, that's uh, 32 years that London has been negative. 32 years. Now, what are the statistical probabilities that in some of the bull markets we've been in, that a market as big as London would be negative? Chances are pretty remote. So what you see here, as far as I'm concerned, is the uh, I wrote about this I think it was last Monday, and if you want to go to my website, you can read it. I, this is what I wrote. This is gold price manipulation scheme laid bare for all to see. And, to, and it's equally as obvious that, once again, an Anglo-American price-fixing operation. It's obvious that, it, once again, it's an Anglo-American price-fixing operation start to finish. Now, in the 60s, the Americans and the British and the other European governments decided they were going to run the... Uh, Gold price, gold price fixing manipulation scheme uh, overtly, and they did. It was out they were telling how much gold they were selling every day to keep the price fix at thirty-five dollars an ounce. So the French, the Gaul, the Gaul under France said, "Hey, Monsieur, we have a foreign deficit of twenty-two million dollars. Here's your twenty-two million. We want the gold." So everybody got piled in the train, and the, I think the U.S. went from nineteen thousand or twenty-one thousand tons of gold down to eight thousand tons, and that's when. Uh, Nixon closed the gold window because if he kept it up, all the gold would have been gone. And we think it's all gone out of Fort Knox anyway, but uh, that's another story. But if you go back to 1979, that's the last year that London was positive, the gold market, any year, ever. And what are the chances of that being the case? Because it's positive just about every year in the X market, not every year. Because when the price was down big time, it was down all over the world. But always when the price is rising, the New York market trumps whatever's going on in the Far East. Because I can tell you right now, if these, these numbers were positive, we'd be looking at a gold price. I can't even imagine. And that's why they're suppressing it, because they don't want it to go. The moment it goes, it blows the paper money system and the financial monetary system and the economic system of the world that we've known since 1971 totally out of the water. The longer they can prevent that, the better. Um, I want to close here by just uh, th this gold surprise, suppression scheme has been going on for a long time and uh, Bill Murphy and Chris Powell of Gaddock cottoned onto this in 1999 just as the bull market was getting started and it was their work and we were alone for a long time but more and more people are coming to understand that this is the case and this chart over the bull market of the last 13 years is if that doesn't convince you I'm afraid that nothing will. Okay. But it's becoming more widespread, and as Chris Paul said in his comment here today, even the Fed governors are coming out and saying, hey, we're rigging the gold market, we should be doing it. And I just want to close with a paragraph that I stole it from, uh, from Doug Noland over at Prudent Bear, uh, his credit bubble boat, and I don't know how many of you people read that, but it's, uh, it's, it's must reading for me every week. And this is what he said in the last paragraph. Massive fiscal and monetary stimulus, along with unprecedented market intervention, has completely overwhelmed the capacity of the markets to effectively price risk. And instead of learning from past mistakes, policymakers are more determined than ever to dictate market pricing. Rather than recognize the prevailing role activist central banks have played in fomenting dysfunctional markets, policymakers believe market outcomes beckon for only greater activism. Until governments can be begin to extricate themselves from the manipulation of interest rates, commodity markets, and stock markets, and risk market pricing more generally, this long cycle of destructive booms and busts will run unabated. 
So they're intervening everywhere. There are no markets anymore. It's just politics. There are only interventions. Thank you very much for coming.